Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Lunch and Learn webinar on substance use and stigma. Uh, this is the second in our Lunch and Learn series hosted by UBC Health and the BC Centre on Substance Use. I want to thank you for taking the time and learning with us today. My name is Liz Yu and I'm the Substance Use and Addiction Partnership Manager with UBC Health and the BC CSU. I'm joining from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil Nations. Um, before we dive in, just a few notes. Uh, please use the Q&A function if you have any questions throughout the presentation. Um, you're also able to upvote any questions that uh, you want to be answered. Uh, lastly, at the end of the webinar, uh, you'll be redirected to a quick survey in your web browser, and we'd appreciate it if you could take a minute to fill that out. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter, Raheem Jan Mohammed. Thank you, Raheem. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Raheem Jan Mohammed. I'm currently an a addiction pharmacy uh, fellow uh, with BCCSU. Just want to thank you all for attending uh, this uh, seminar this afternoon, this webinar. Um, it's uh, one of the ones in our Lunch and Learn series uh, with substance use and addiction. Uh, so I'll just get uh, moved to the next slide. That'd be great. So just want to uh, uh, really uh, sp speak to this. Uh, this fellowship is supported by Shoppers Drug Mart. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Shoppers Drug Mart, for supporting our fellowship. And uh, would like to thank all of you for spending some time today um, with me uh, and my team at BCCSU and UBC. I'll start by reflect respectfully acknowledging that I am a humble guest on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I acknowledge that ongoing criminalization, institutionalization, discrimination against people who use drugs disproportionately harms Indigenous peoples. Next slide, please. So here's a quote I'd like you all to read. This is stigma. You know, it's what people say, um, don't say, don't, you know, they care, don't provide the impacts of internal narrative of the person who has been told by a lack of services, a lot of disregard that, that they are not of any value or worth caring for. So the quote here reads, you know, people tend to look at you in a certain way. Some people just stop talking to you. Some people will just ignore you. And some people just step away from you. Well, it happened with one of the nurses. One time I was sick. And by me just being sick, the nurses stopped attending to me. And this was uh, from a study in New York City looking at experiences with, uh, with people um, who, you know, who inject drugs. And this was a quote from a man who went to a hospital uh, with opiate withdrawal. And this is exactly how he felt. So keep this in mind uh, throughout uh, this afternoon and how people feel and how stigma affects their lives when they're in hospital. Next slide, please. So let's go over some learning objectives for today. First one um, we're going to go over is just to understand what stigma is, you know, define stigma, describe the impact of stigma on people with lived experience of substance use. We also want to understand the role of healthcare providers and educators in reducing stigma. We also want to identify ways to reduce stigma and discrimination. So we want to find out like how it impacts people who use drugs. And as a healthcare provider, educator, preceptor, I know some of you have students, we want to find out how you can educate others to help reduce stigma and provide better health care. Next slide, please. So as we have all heard, I'm sure, um, you know, we all know that there's been an emergency declared in 2016 of this public health emergency because the increase of the ongoing overdose crisis has grown. And when you look at the chart, when you actually take a look at the chart here, you can see the increase in, in the impact. In 2016, BC's provincial health officer declared it as an emergency, and, and we identify stigma as one of the ongoing factors. It's resulted in a lack of impact, uh, like a lack of impactful response. Um, it's also impacted why many people are dying alone um, who use substances, you know, so they, they don't have the support in place and, and they're on their own. We really want to help reduce stigma around substance use and, and the one intervention we have to address this overdose crisis on a multi-system level. Next slide, please. So what is stigma? Stigma, it refers to the negative attitudes, prejudice, negative behavior, discrimination towards people 
uh, based on distinguishing characteristics. As you can see from the slide, right away, you see it's a, it's a cartoon, but the depiction here kind of illustrates what we're talking about. It's those negative attitudes before they see something or someone that already pre, you know, exist. Um, you know, it's a complex, you know, social process, right? So reducing stigma is one of the key things we want to do. It's, it's a complex process of reducing labeling, stereotyping, othering, devaluing, and discriminating against. Next slide, please. So speaking to multi-levels of stigma, there are three levels that we're looking at right now um, on this slide here. There's the public structural stigma, interpersonal stigma, and self-stigma. So public stigma, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to uh, everyone here? It's informed by laws, systems, society as a whole. Uh, and, it, and it actually occurs when the general population endorses these stereotypes and discriminates against a group of people. Public stigma often causes people to avoid seeking help because they feel embarrassment. And in this picture, you can see all the words that, 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 are, that are written there, that embarrassment that this individual is feeling. They have shame about their problem. You know, stigma is also perpetuated by laws and discriminatory results of public stigma and addictions is complex with its impact conflated with criminalization, drug laws which criminalize health conditions, thus suggesting people are criminals because of their health conditions. Stigma also results in complacency, a lack of funds and urgency towards an ongoing crisis. It's not viewed as a social problem, but rather a problem for others. Interpersonal stigma occurs when, like just give me, I'll give you an example. So if someone asks for help and encounter negative public attitudes, that's basically what that is. In some cases, healthcare professionals might think people with substance use disorder are manipulative or violent, but they might believe that they don't have motivation or the willpower needed to change. And then we have self-stigma. It's just when a person internalizes all the negative messages and prejudice. We'll get to the next slide, please. So looking at this, we're, stigma, it doesn't occur in a vacuum. So people experience multiple forms of stigma. Discriminations are more likely to experience harms. So the uh, consider this uh, as an example. An intersection of substance use stigma and social marginalization and oppression of poverty, which results in compounding negative health outcomes. This is what we're looking at. And I know this slide, um, you know, we're gonna issue all these slides out, so don't worry about making notes, the slide deck will be sent out to you. So we have this word cloud uh, based on social determinants of health care and substance use. Take a moment and look at all these words and really, really understand it's a combination of biological, psychological, psych psychological, sorry, and social factors that contribute to why a person is actually struggling with substance use. The social detriments of health are the social and economic conditions a person's life can play a significant role on a person's uh, life that can play a significant role on a person's overall wellness and can impact addiction and substance use related issues. Some of the social determinants of health that are particularly significant, freedom from discrimination and violence, social inclusion, access to economic resources. It's important that we realize and recognize how these, these determinants uh, impact the complex condition of addiction and interact with other forms of discrimination and stigma a person may experience, including colonization. Next slide. So colonization, drug laws and substance use. There's been a history of ongoing impact of colonization, harms of colon colonialism, including distrust of colonial institutions, intergenerational trauma as a result of the ra racist government policies such as residential school systems and the 60s scoop. Trauma is associated as a risk of substance use. Historical and ongoing racism, including systemic racism in the healthcare system 
as highlighted in the plain sight report, which I have here, it, it has resulted in a lack of access, a denial of care, and worsening health outcomes. I really recommend um, those of you here um, watching today and listening today to review this plain sight report. It was released in 2020, and it was a review by a former judge, Dr. Mary Ellen Turple Lanfon, that describes findings of a widespread systemic racism against Indigenous peoples in the BC healthcare system. Overall, we're looking at now the overdose epidemiology. Here are some stats. So in BC, there's 83% of illicit drug toxicity deaths occurring inside residences. And we have had 79% of them as fatal overdoses, and they've been among men. And from nine, 19 to 59 years old are the most impacted. So these are deaths occurring in private residences. Despite the common misconception, it's among people who are experiencing homelessness. In Fraser Health, which has the highest number of overdose deaths, analysis has shown that overdose deaths are occurring in private residences and the majority work in the trades. This speaks to the shame and stigma related to men who use substances. This prevents them from seeking care and instead risk their lives. Reviewing here, we have many misconceptions that contribute to stigma. Substance use occurs across the spectrum from beneficial to non-problematic substance use disorder. So often perpetuated by negative stereotypes in the media. As educators and healthcare professionals, it's important to be aware that these, that for us to educate others to disrupt the stigma. Substance use disorder is a health condition. It's not a moral one. It has to be treated as one. So when someone comes in and works, you know, comes into a clinic and has a substance use disorder, it's treated as a health condition, like all other health conditions. Addiction is not a choice. You have to understand this. There are many reasons why people use drugs, including trauma, injury, some mental health challenges. The social determinants of health can impact the addiction and substance use related issues. You know, people who use drugs have, have a substance use disorder. You have to understand this and, and they're deserving of kindness and compassion. Tough love can push people further away. So in essence, I just want you to relate you know, really, really think about these, these four misconceptions uh, throughout the rest of the talk. Thank you. Next slide. So substance use stigma silences people, resulting in guilt and shame towards asking for help or accessing services. There was a moment um, I was working uh, at VGH when an individual, um, when I went to approach him and uh, he was covered up in a blanket and he really didn't want to speak to me. Uh, didn't really get my name or anything. As soon as I walked in the room, he just covered up right away. And, and I believe that there's a lot of resources that are available and everybody's trying to, to attend to this individual. But I really saw firsthand the guilt and shame towards ask, asking for help or, or accessing the services that were provided. You know, it's really a major barrier, uh, you know, to accessing healthcare. And then you get substandard care. Mm -hmm. So, so, this is what ends up happening, where people often de be denied of services due to policies and the actions of people. Stigmatizing views influences clinical practice. It leads to disrespectful, potentially harmful treatment. I've seen misdiagnoses happen, and, and then it discourages people who use drugs and seeking support from healthcare providers. It creates an environment where people are judged for addiction, and accusing of being responsible for their own illness. Again, substance use disorder is a health condition. We have to, and needs to be treated like one. And, and the stigmatizing language and shame and judgment prevents constructive dialogue about seeking help. Right now, you know, we're gonna hear from some people uh, and their experiences of substance use and stigma. There's a video here, I'm just gonna read what it's about. It's about the BC Mental Health and Substance Use Services. Now, this is looking into the destructive nature of stigma in our communities of healthcare and healthcare settings and how it's impacted people's healthcare they receive. Can I get uh, the video rolling right now? Thanks. To me, stigma 
is when you fail to see the person, you instead see your stereotype of the person and treat them accordingly. The problem with mental health and addiction for me is that the stigma that's associated with it like really ties into who you fundamentally are as a person. And when the stigma is so entrenched in our society, it starts to become something that I've believed about myself. So it is still to this day so hard for me to separate societal stigma from personal shame. And I think that's where it gets dangerous because it makes people feel like they're not deserving of help. The stigma around that I've faced on a personal level is like this inability to trust. And it goes both ways. For me, like the stigma in my life is that my actions and, and my outward reactions to different life circumstances has been a path of using substances to numb the hurt the pain, the shame, the guilt. By my actions, I've painted myself into this box. And, you know, the stigma of others is like, remember when you did this? I just don't trust that you'll be able to actually stay clean. For me, it's like wearing what feels to be like a dirty coat of mental health and substance abuse. Society has looked at my outward actions in coping with life and has labeled me as somebody that's not trustworthy, that isn't capable of success, that I come with huge risk. People don't even listen to you, they just look at you. I've dealt with stigma on all different levels. Even now, my life has gotten so much better in the last year. I still have people talk down to me when I go into stores or just are super, super rude to me, even if I'm extremely nice. And it's been like that my whole life. People categorize people just by the way they look without even actually getting to know them. Like I remember the stigma. I felt as I'm in a mental health crisis, in psychosis, believing the world's out to kill me, and I'm in handcuffs. I don't trust the RCMP, I don't trust the hospital staff, people looking at me, people staring at me, people seeing me in handcuffs, and just assuming, worst case, like, that I'm a criminal, that I'm someone who is a harm to, to society. Meanwhile, not knowing who Chris was as a person. You know, if someone gets cancer or breaks their leg or has diabetes, people don't blame the person. And yet with things like uh, substance abuse disorder and a uh, mental illness, you know, there is this propensity to look at it from the outside and go, well, you chose that, right? Like you chose to put that in your body. You choose to not get out of bed, not cook for yourself, not shower, not work. The only way I could really reconcile myself with this was to look at myself as a young girl full of nothing but potential and say, would she ever have wanted this? Would she ever have chosen this for herself? The answer is no. I remember being a little kid and unfortunately though, I thought being bad was cool. I mean, I lived in a complex in Toronto. I thought it was the coolest being around people with weapons and selling drugs. Unfortunately, that fueled my life for the last 29 years. Like, I grew up thinking that that stuff was the good thing and the cool thing. And, like, I got into that so young that I never knew any other thing. I put in applications when I was young as, like, a paper boy, pizza shops, and fry stands. People just didn't trust me anyways. And they always treated me like I was a little hoodlum. So then I always just acted like one and thought it was cool. Now, almost 30 years later, I've been trying to distance myself from that so much. I feel like I can't show weakness because if I show weakness, then I'll be judged for it. Because of all that's happened in my life, that if I'm not crossing every T, dotting every I, being perfect, being flawless. In my perfectionist view of trying to overcome this, I, I get stuck in this self-defeating trap of being perfect, which is unrealistic. And it, it would always lead me back out down a path of self-destruction because I just can't be perfect. I'm a human being, I make mistakes, I mess up. The biggest myth that I've seen and experienced is that if you're actively addicted to drugs, that you're not then credible, you're not trustworthy, you're not honest, you're not reliable, you're not anything really. And that's a good chunk of the reason why I was a bad person. I was addicted to drugs for a very long time. And the only way that I could get by is if I was a mean person. I often hear that it's weak-minded individuals who struggle with addiction, and that's not the case. When I'm in a state of mental crisis or when I'm in a place where I've relapsed, it hurts my heart. And that just fuels continued use and the snowball effect happens. 
a myth that I tell myself is that I'm worthless and I'm not worthy to have a future, which is a lie. I'm very capable. I'm very skilled. I'm talented. I'm lovable. I'm a life worth saving. There's a lot of good people and they're not just drug addicts. They're not just homeless. They're mothers, daughters, sisters, brothers, fathers, and they all have stories too. All right. Thank you. So that video right now, I'd like everyone just to think for a moment and just reflect on that video. Like what were, like what experiences have you had? Does any, do any of your experiences relate to what you saw in that video? And I'd encourage you to join in on the chat and share your experiences or ask questions on the chat. Uh, there's a lot of uh, important uh, aspects of, of really uh, everything that they've said. And, and, you know, the listening, uh, like through that video and listening to it again, I've seen it before. It really makes a big impact in, in the way that I approach individuals um, with substance use disorders moving forward in my practice, um, you know, working uh, in my community pharmacy, as well as on my uh, rotations that I have with my uh, fellowship program. So, you know, questions to ask, like, how did you learn about drugs? You know, what are your values in relationship to, to yeah. substances? You know, like coffee, you know, alcohol, you know, prescribed medications. And, and do you have any biases or fears of people that use drugs? Like, how are these bias, biases showing up right now? And, and I do appreciate, you know, the chat happening right now. Um, we'll take a look at some of that um, at this moment, too. Like, th there's a couple of key things that are written here, here by, um, by Janet. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing those important voices. You know, really, I appreciate that, you know, because these are the important, you know, voices that we need to hear day in and day out. Um, Donna mentioning, you know, the impact of the fellow saying, I'm a life worth saving. Like, how does that really hit you, hit home uh, for each one of you? And, and how can you carry that through to your students, through your, your, your mentorship that you have in place uh, in your programs, or your colleagues, or even in your day-to-day uh, -day lives with yourselves and your, and your families? Um, you know, are, like, are these biases showing up? So we want to make sure that we really impact that. And, and really you know, they take that, these messages that were in that video home. Next slide, please. A couple of key things um, I, I wanna mention um, before we move on to the power language. Uh, when you're in a position of privilege and power as a healthcare professional, you, know, you can challenge stigma by being proactive. You know, Self-reflective, compassionate, you, know, you gotta understand, do the work to be informed about updates in, in the care. Further be mindful about biases towards people, including economic, race, ethnicity, sexuality, as they intersect these experiences of stigma. So as we move forward, we're gonna go through um, the slide here. I know there's a lot of information. And again, like I said, the slide deck will be available. Uh, and this is the power of language. So looking at the first slide, looking at the first picture, when you see it, one person is referred to as a substance abuser and the other person as having a substance use disorder. These are the different powers of language that we need to understand um, with, those in, with this information alone. You know, hopefully that will start to change the way you think, the way you talk. And, and we're gonna go through stigmatizing language right now. So keep these thoughts in mind. Um, and on the next slide, we are gonna have a poll question. So I'm just gonna go over a few more things here and then we'll have a poll question on the next slide, okay? So stigmatizing language, whether it's used in a healthcare setting, uh, news, media, you know, it can dehumanize people. Um, people who use drugs can be, result in discrimination. So it has a de direct detrimental impact on the health of people uh, who use drugs. We want to make sure that, you know, they, they don't want to be less deserving of the care that we provide any other individual uh, because they do have a health condition. And, and we want to be able to treat them the, way, the same way we treat others. So we're gonna move uh, to the next slide. And right now I'd like everybody to, to get ready for a poll. Um, think about the language you use, like how many of these terms, so you don't have to mention the terms, right? We're just gonna ask individuals out of these, how many we got here, six. Out of these eight terms, how many of these terms have you used in the past? Like, have you ever used any of these terms to refer to a patient, colleagues? students, anyone else? Like, have you ever used any of these terms to refer about, you know, people who use drugs? 
So if you can, right now, we're gonna, we're gonna get the poll up. And now after that, after the poll, we're gonna go over the results. So, okay, so we got four different categories. So do you use all of them, most of them, some of them, or none of them? And if I can uh, get you all to do a little bit of uh, the poll, and then once that's over, we'll share the result shortly. So looking at our results, um, and again, once the results are, once you've viewed them, you may want to click them off just to get back onto the slide deck because it might not uh, disappear on its own. So we've got about 5% using none, 72% using some, 15% using most, and 8% using all. So at any point, it seems like some of them are still being used. So let's, let's go over um, some different uh, aspects of respectful language uh, and, and we'll open up some more dialogue. And if there are any questions again, or any, any uh, comments, please continue to use our chat function. So we'll move to the next slide. So how can you uh, as an individual help change the conversation? So using first person language. So instead of saying user, we want to acknowledge the individual. Use per first person first language. Person who uses substances instead of user. You want to use language again that reflects the medical nature of use disorders. So instead of saying abuser or junkie, druggy, you know, alcoholic, we want to acknowledge and say person with a substance use disorder. You know, using language that promotes recovery and is str uh, strength based. So instead of someone that's not using their medication and saying not compliant, and I know as a pharmacist, it's uh, something that I've done in the past and, and I, I would probably have to check myself realistically and, and make sure I don't do it moving forward uh, when mentioning or sending a, an email to a doctor, or sending a fax saying, you know, this patient is non-compliant. Um, trying to change that focus and, and using languages as opted not to or not in agreement with the treatment plan. This allows for promoting more recovery. It's, it's more strength-based. So I, I would recommend those pharmacists that are out here on, on, the, on the webinar really look at that as some changes that they can make to their clinical and uh, community practice. So we also want to avoid uh, slang and idioms. So, and I, I can honestly say that, yeah, I have done that like in my past, uh, you know, when I was working, I would be like doing uh, urinary drug schemes and I would say, oh, it's dirty or it's clean. Um, right now it's positive or negative. So a little bit, you want to avoid the slang and avoid idioms. So a little bit more respectful. So person first language, a couple of things to keep in mind here. It's referring to the person before describing the behavior or the condition. It's important because it acknowledges the person's condition is not that the person's defining characteristic. So we wanna make sure that's in place. The second thing, the medical nature, okay? So the medical nature is ranging from personal factors, social, environmental, or political ones. Avoid terms that reinforce a belief uh, that an addiction is a failure of morals or personality rather than a medical issue. So again, we wanna avoid abuser and junkie and stick with substance use disorder as best we can, okay? Um, we also wanna promote recovery. So it's important to recognize that people have a choice. Um, you know, they have autonomy and are treated with respect and understanding in all encounters. So it conveys optimism and it supports recovery when we, when we use that language opted not to or not in agreement with. And again, back to the slang and idioms, they're not used in literature, uh, professional literature, but um, you know, they could be used just in regular uh, communication. So it does have a significant level of stigma attached to them. So just keep that in mind. So if we do that, you know, we'll, we'll, hopefully we can change the way we're talking now. So we're gonna go through another reflection here. And you're gonna ask yourself, how do I talk to people who use drugs? As an educator, healthcare provider, uh, some of you could be preceptors, some of you could have students, um, you know, going out into community, um, some of your community members. Ask yourself this, like, how can language exacerbate stigma? You know, is not is difficult. Like, what you're saying, the reflection that it has on someone else, like, reflect on yourself right now and understand what have you used in the past and how do you think it impacted that individual? 
And what can you do moving forward to make that change? So we're shaped by culture, laws, media, relationships with people. You know, we pick a language from our peers as well. And I, I know, like, we have uh, friends that, you know, they might speak a certain way and I might have to help curb that and change that. Uh, and, and being an educator and, and being part of the change is, is what I'm here for, definitely. We, with a shift, uh, as we shift in society, you know, recognizing that substance use disorders, uh, um, you know, oh, I lost my place here. As we shift in society, recognize that substance use disorders and substance use are shaped by culture, society, and complexities. We need to shift our language. So it's in all of us, including, including people who use drugs. So the education doesn't stop here. It, it continues through those individuals as well. So it's important to not only think about our patients, students in your class are important in your clinic. And it's a very high likelihood that in each class, there's someone who's affected by substance use in one way, either personally, maybe a family member, maybe there's a friend. You know, the language use is so important to build a safer, more compassionate environment for our learners, patients, and each other. So I'll move on to the next slide. So we're gonna work with reducing stigma for people who use drugs. In a collaboration research project between clinicians and people who use drugs, there are five principles. We're gonna watch a video right now from um, he, the video of a guy, of guy uh, Felicella. It's a, he's a peer clinical advisor for BCCSU and Overdose Emergency Response and Regional Addiction Program at BCH. His powerful story is a testament to the influences healthcare professionals have in both negative and positive on someone's health and recovery. Many aspects of the story are relevant to the five principles. Uh, Libby, uh, can you go ahead with the video? Remember why you wanted to get into health in the first place? Was it to help others? Uh, was it to improve the quality of people's lives? Then don't ever forget that. People down here, I mean, I even had my friends who were substance users down here. They came up to me and said, dude, you, you, you cannot, you have to stop. And, you know, they're not talking about them, they're talking about me. It's like, dude, like, please, like, go. From 83 to 93, I was in and out of the area, but from 1993 to 2013, I never left a two-block radius and really hung out right in front of uh, Insight, before it was Insight. <clears throat> and um, you know went through the first dueling public health emergency um, which was the HIV AIDS crisis in the 90s and also the overdose crisis. I've lost um, many friends um, to HIV AIDS and many friends to overdose. Getting me to go to the hospital for for bone infections was like I had to be nearly dead to get me there. Um, and the reality is, is even when I got there, I wasn't treated fairly as a person or as an individual. I was treated as a drug-seeking individual. And even with all the, the pain meds, and this is a true story, while I was in St. Paul's Hospital um, and I had the infection in my leg, um, the doctor prescribed me with, you know, lots of morphine, methadone, breakthroughs, all these, you know, medications, and, and I continued to use heroin. And um, he approached me one day in my room and said, you, you, we give you all these drugs to, you know, help, and you continue to use heroin. And I said, explain it to you. I said, the drugs that you give me help me with the physical pain, but this drug helps me with the emotional void that's in my soul. And he couldn't understand that. And he discharged me with um, an active bone infection in my leg, saying that the antibiotics won't work because I won't stop using heroin. And um, that to me really showed uh, just how egregious uh, some people are and the treatment that substance users get. And it was the main reason of why I never went back and it was one of the main reasons why CTCT was developed in the downtown east side. And when I did go to CTCT, they said to me, we don't care that you use drugs. All we care about is that you're here every four hours to get your antibiotics. If you have drugs and you want to use drugs, you can use them in your room. We just want to save your leg. You believe the lies that you hear everybody say to you in your life. Obviously, the verbal abuse, I think verbal abuse in my life is so crippling. 
as a person is that even if somebody criticized me in a way, even somebody gave me a compliment, I felt so uh, gross inside. It was so hard for me to accept that. I just didn't believe it. And it's because you were often told that you were a piece of garbage, not only from your childhood, but then you reflect on that from how society treats you. And so I carried that. That is a heavy burden for people to carry. And at that moment, that was somewhat released where it made me think, like, maybe, maybe there's more to it than just what people keep thinking it is. Because inside, I knew what I was going through and the pain. I just didn't trust people to talk to. And so what, what my suggestion would be to somebody who's new to healthcare or working in healthcare is this. You have to put yourselves uh, in, in people's shoes and to understand even if your life, imagine if you had a job and you had no place to live and you had no car and you had no food, but you still had a job and you're sleeping in a shelter and now you're hungry and you have to go to work. Like put yourself in somebody's shoes. Just, you don't have to put yourself exactly in their shoes, but imagine if we eliminated some things out of your life, especially your housing. Um, and then, or if you're going to school, um, all these things where if you eliminate or put these challenges in your life, how would you react to them? How would you respond? You have to go to work. It's like, but you have no housing. Um, you know, or where are you going to get your next meal? Where, what about your belongings? Where are they going to stay? And one of the biggest things that I've often remembered throughout my journey is this, is I've never forgotten how you made me feel. And remember that. If, I'll always remember the ones that treated me good, but I'll also always remember the ones that didn't. It's funny now when I come down here, people are like, oh, I know you're doing good. And I'm like, how so? And they're like, I've seen you smile more times in five minutes than I did the whole 20 years I knew you. And from my friends, uh, that's, that's really how special it is for me because, um, you know, I broke bread with them for, for decades and, and um, you know, we shared a lot uh, of our struggles. And, uh, and just to have them here, you know, for me, it's just, uh, it's powerful. So very, very powerful uh, video by Guy Felicella, a great speaker, a great person. Um, I've had the pleasure of having him at one of our uh, educational sessions as well. He's, he's a really good guy and I, I appreciate him taking the time to get that video uh, for us. All right, so we're gonna go through these principles and I know there's a lot of um, text on these slides coming up and they will be shared after. So just focus on a couple of things here that that really uh, you know will hit home and and when looking at the principles, I've taken you know little sections of them and, and really tried to make them as part of my own day. So the first principle, and I'll just read through it here. So it's reducing barriers to care, fostering engagement and participation for those of experience with substance use, marginalization, and shaping the care and and shaping the care they and their peers receive. So engagement and participation can include, so active listening and acknowledging concerns. So what's active listening? So active listening, uh, when, when reviewing active listening, uh, it's basically reflecting, listening to the individual, clarifying. So I always ask initially if, if they have time to talk, if a patient has time to talk or someone has time to have a moment to, so that I can really be there, be in the moment, be there for them. and and then listen, summarize, and then sharing your thoughts, you know, sharing what you have to say. Again, you want to ensure that patients know their rights. So in the engagement um, involving people who use drugs and peer advocates, so get them involved in, in participating and also encouraging staff to engage in experimental learning in community settings. Uh, initially working in the hospital, uh, when we get called on to, to actually do a, a review on an individual, it's, it's tough when they've seen, like I mentioned earlier, five, six, seven different people in a day. You want to make sure that they're ready to talk if they're not ready at that time. It's best to have them have their time and then let them know that you're there. As long as they know that that's happening, then that will help with reducing the barrier and then also might get that engagement and participation from them. So we'll move to principle two. So principle two is recognizing people's health and healthcare uh, priorities, experiences influenced by history and policies that criminalize drug use. So 
in a setting that you're in, in any setting you've been in before, people feel that with the stigma that they're under surveillance and, and, and be sensitive to giving people space. So ensuring that a care setting is free of the threat of criminalization is also very important, very powerful. We want to assess patients for cravings, withdrawal, and pain. When we look at prescriptions, when I look at prescriptions coming in, I've changed my way of thinking. I look at a prescription and, and I look at their profiles and I want to pay attention to them as an individual. Treat the patient, not the paperwork. Look at the paperwork. It has to get done. You want to treat the patient and make sure that don't always assume that they're drug seeking. Looking at the prescriptions, if they're getting them more often, it's better to ask why and better to find out what the whole scenario is. And, and all this comes into uh, the stigma that, that's being created if we automatically think that they're drug seeking. Uh, you know, don't assume people with substance use disorders don't require pain medication and other pain management. They, they might have other conditions. They might have underlying issues that they're trying to deal with other underlying conditions. And, you know, those who consume opioids may require increased doses of pain medication due to high tolerance. So understanding opioid pathways and the way they work, the way pain receptors work, um, you know, different pathways of pain. There's different mechanisms in the way an individual's pain management needs to, to be managed. And, and it's up to us to be able to understand that. You know, we have to ensure that the training's in place for clinicians and, and assessing and managing the withdrawal, like precipitated withdrawal. Like, there's a whole other topic on that. And you can always look at our site, our BCCSU. We have lots of information on that as well. When you're looking at it and really in depth, you'll be able to get more information. And, and again, really want to focus on treating the patient um, initially with what their needs are. We'll move to the next principle. So we have principle three. So here's where the history of a patient, when you're actually uh, engaging them in care, engaging um, everybody with um, individuals uh, in terms of uh, you know their history, we got to find out what trauma they had. Maybe there's something they can mention. Maybe something uh, violent in the past. So consider their past histories and their ability to engage with providers. Also, um, just a quick note, just add a little aside here um, from my uh, support group. So I wanna make sure that people write to the chat to everyone, not to the host. Um, so only I can see the comments right now. So just if they can type everyone or uh, rather than only host and panelists, that'd be great. So if you got, if there's any comments, we'll make sure that they go to everyone, uh, not the host. Okay, thanks. So another, just to get back to this, oh, I, I want to get back to that, sorry. So just to incorporate the trauma-informed practice. So recognize um, what's happening in the, with that individual. Uh, there was an uh, individual that I looked at um, in, in a hospital a couple of weeks ago. And when I did the research in terms of listening, sitting with them, I was able to get a lot more information and was able to find out that they did have an opioid use dis disorder that was underlying. Um, and uh, it was one of those moments that I felt that I took the time, uh, really went through the past history uh, of their trauma and violence and was able to find out that they were still using opioids um, at the same time that they came in for an alcohol use disorder. So again, recognizing things that people are experiencing living in the midst of trauma will help us, you know, help with diagnoses. Um, so we don't have any misdiagnoses in that moment and support that individual and engage and, you know, with their provider and, and a care plan. So make sure when you're asking questions, ask permission. I always ask if there's time, like, do you have time to talk? Um, you know, is it okay if I spend a few moments with you? Or I would say, um, I might spend a few moments with you, go over a bunch of questions. It might be long. Um, if you feel like cutting me off at any moment, please do so. Uh, and if they get that initial uh, kind of engagement from you, knowing who you are, knowing what you're there for, they might be able to get through most of the questions, but partway through, they might stop and just let them know that you'll, you, you'll be there and you'll be back for them. And I'm sure that you'll be able to support them and engage with them a little bit further through their care. Okay, with the next principle. So 
quick thing here. Um, here's some examples on reframing language. So um, again, um, you know, referring, I'm usually referring to myself here, but I've seen it in practice, seen it in my uh, community pharmacy as well. Uh, initially um, going from what's wrong to what has happened. So we're trying to go from a deficit perspective to a trauma-informed strength-based perspective. So if you can read through the slides. So you have from symptoms to adaptations, you have disorder to a response. There's a few different methods here in order for us to help change um, the way we speak. And, you know, working in trauma-informed way, it requires a shift in thinking. So we're going to have to think a little bit differently. Um, we got to reframe, uh, you know, instead of talking to terms that are manipulative, like this person's manipulative. We want to find out, oh, this individual has, uh, you know, difficulty asking what they want. So review these slides, uh, you know, make sure that you can try to, you know, take little pearls from here and, and try to use them in your practice as well. So principle four is destigmatized care emphasizes relationships and trust as a priority and outcomes. Just resisting assuming that people automatically trust you. You're coming in with a white, like myself coming in with a white coat. That, that, it's not that it's a barrier, but it could be at first, depending on what they've had in the past in terms of uh, their interactions, but we want to change our destigmatized care and it'll bring that relationship back and that trust back with those individuals. So show some genuine concern, like talk to individuals uh, and then, you know, show that empathy that I know that we all have within us and, and really um, educate our peers and our students with that as well. Next slide. So here's the fifth principle. So destigmatized care in, requires workplace culture of respect and safety. So the, it's, this is all about policies and practices that can help reduce stigma. So in training, training your students, um, policies, in educational, um, I don't know if we have specific guidelines in, at UBC in pharmacy school uh, in regards to destigmatized care, if there are topics like that that are available to speak to, um, I would recommend having those in place. Um, it's all about changing uh, stigmatizing language and the norms, like advocating for that. So we need to move forward in this direction um, with these principles. And I'm sure that, that we'll find that people who use drugs will be seen more valued, um, they'll have healthier outcomes, and they'll reach out and, and be able to get the care that they need in all our care centers and uh, uh, clinics and community pharmacies. We can move to the next slide. So here's a quick slide on what you can do, and it's kind of a review. Um, on what we've been talking about. So we want to recognize, you know, that a substance use disorder is a health issue. It's not a moral one. We also want to recognize that people who use drugs are real people who are deserving of care. So, you know, talking to people like you, talk to all your patients. If someone comes with a substance use disorder or they have hypertension, they have cholesterol, you know, they're real people, um, you know, they deserve your, your care. Um, we want to learn how to be a safe person to talk with as well prioritize it through compassion, empathy, and really incorporate that trauma-informed care using respectful language and advocating for policies within our communities, within our educational institutions, within our community pharmacies and our you know, hospitals. Um, and we also wanna educate others. Next slide. So here's some further reflection uh, for people facilitating education. So, Again, uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Do you have a curriculum that focuses on substance use, self-reflection on bias and language? Does it include any anti-stigma education? Um, is there an opportunity for you to create um, you know, this in your uh, current curriculum? Do you create opportunities for people to meet folks with lived experiences, being mentored uh, who specialize in this area? Again, what practicum opportunities are there in your program? And is there a plan like for sites, like for students um, uh, that are supported? Like, is there a plan in place at your site? Or is, have you asked your site, is there a plan for this for their students? And you yourself, are you ready for this challenge? Ask yourself. So we have some more additional education and training. Again, these links can be sent to you. Um, all these are available at our BCCSU um, website and we have the addiction care treatment online course with a opioid addiction treatment support program and there's also toward the heart and some trauma-informed practice so these links and some of the slides that we've had from today are from links directly uh, from these programs i know i'm running out of time a little bit 
Uh, here's another set of resources. So if we can definitely um, issue these out, there's a lot of information here, uh, definitely uh, incorporated into your practice or into your community settings and into some policies or procedures. Uh, it'd be great for everyone to have an opportunity to be able to get these resources um, and, and issue them out to your students or, or your fellow colleagues. Let's see. All right, I think we made it. A little bit to spare. So just uh, gonna open it up for questions. Um, if you can use the Q&A function and I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Um, or if you'd like to reach out to me later, if we're short for time, uh, my information uh, will be sent over to you as well. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, we got about a few minutes here. Thanks, Raheem. I'm just wondering, um, as folks formulate their thoughts, um, wondering in your practice or, you know, at your pharmacy, uh, over the years, have you seen a shift in attitudes? Um, and if so, you know, what do you think contributed to that? Or what have you done to help foster that? Yeah, no, definitely. I appreciate the question. So what I've noticed, um, even from my learnings from the educational sessions through the fellowship program, uh, I've learned to really focus on the patient um, when they come up to my counter in the community setting. And I used to be the individual and I probably still do that once in a while. And when I get a prescription, um, I'd be out, I'd tell them, oh, what did your doctor tell you about this? Uh, and I really have changed to ask, what do you know about this? Uh, versus what has your doctor told you about this, just to get that engagement, because I feel that we're the conversation, I'm not giving them an opportunity, and I'm trying to be more an active listener. Uh, if I'm able to do that initially, even when they drop off their prescription, or during a consultation, I get more engagement from that individual. And what it actually does, in fact, I think their outcomes are more healthier, because they feel more empowered. Uh, by their health and they know that they're in charge and it's not more directive like uh, that whole um, policy where I'm in a white coat and I'm like here do this I know take it this way and you'll feel better uh, kind of person so I feel giving them more ownership uh, creates more conversation I'm getting more um, feedback from that from patients directly as well which is great all right thank you and and just a quick thing um I mentioned earlier about the individual that um, kind of it bottled up as soon as I walked in the room. That was the individual that had a um, underlying uh, substance use disorder. Uh, it was an opioid use disorder and didn't tell anybody about it in hospital. Came in, um, you know, with a leg abscess. And after speaking to me, he had brought in um, morphine with him and had it on him. And he was uh, reluctant to let them know. And he had been going through um, precipitated withdrawal and was trying to self uh, medicate. And by opening up to me, we were able to get him onto a program uh, on an opioid uh, program, like old program. And he was doing much better with, with his stay in hospital. And so, yeah, it, it's all about opening up conversation, um, that stigmatizing uh, conversation and the change uh, that we're trying to, to really uh, relay. And I appreciate the program for giving me that uh, educational background and allowing me to speak today as well. Great, thank you. I see a question in the Q and A. Um, have you seen more of a team-based approach to care when working with people with substance use disorders? And I think you can probably pull from your yeah. fellowship experiences yeah, as sure. well. I, I was um, I was out at um, two different centers. So I've been out at uh, CPAS uh, here at BGH, and I was at. Uh, um, a withdrawal management center out in Surrey. So at CPAS, uh, what they do is anybody that comes in with a substance use disorder or uh, a patient that comes in with uh, an ailment that let's say they were using fentanyl or they currently uh, have been, uh, had a urinary drug screen and had, uh, you know, some substances that were uh, positive, they would call on a, a, us as a team. So it would be myself, uh, a nurse, and we would look at their overall um, life and quality of life and what they're looking for and, and what their health outcomes that they're looking for. And what it did was I was able to connect with social worker, a nurse, um, and then I was able to connect with the community 
in terms of their, uh, where they're going to live and make sure that their stay is going to be okay and their discharge is okay. So it encompassed almost every aspect of what I enjoy about my job, where you're actually reaching out to resources and all of us are, uh, we kind of communicated together and made a, a plan, but we had the patient part of that. So it really um, was a team-based approach, but the patient was involved every step of the way. And by being involved as a patient, that gave them a lot more uh, encouragement to get better. And they were able to discharge from the hospital quicker and felt excited uh, in terms of the approach that they were taking and really thanked everybody on the way out. Never had a patient leave thanking everybody on the way out and waving like, bye everybody. And they're, they're just about to leave the hospital. I haven't seen that in a long time. So really appreciate that approach. Thank you. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A and I think we're about time for wrap up. So um, I just want to thank you, Raheem, so much for this presentation on such an important topic. Um, I think there's so much in here that everyone can take away and learn from. Um, so I, I do hope all the audience members found this informative and uh, I invite you to join us for our next Lunch and Learn session on March 24th. Um, and we'll be diving deeper into trauma and violence informed care, something that Raheem did mention in his presentation today. Um, so see you then. Thanks everyone. <laughs>